Good day to all and everyone. Welcome to our session, The Stories We Tell, Putting Mental Health and Narratives at the Heart of Peacebuilding Practice. It is nice to see so many of you interested in this topic, and I believe that whether you work in peacebuilding or mental health and psychosocial support, you will understand the necessity for a joint approach if we are to achieve positive and sustainable peace. If you are working in peace building, you must have encountered challenges, especially in your dialogue work or reconciliation work, if the trauma was not addressed and if the healing of communities was not part of the process. And if you are working in mental health and psychosocial support, you would probably see your work not having sustained impact if the causes of violence that led to trauma in the first place are not addressed and not dealt with. Over the recent years, and particularly now with the focus on mental health and well-being in peace building, and in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, practitioners and academics and policy makers widely agree that peace building and psychosocial approaches are closely interlinked and should be brought together. But in practice, while these linkages between conflict and trauma are recognized and widely discussed, in practice, the, the um, uh, integrating mental health and psychosocial approaches into conflict prevention and peace building work are full of some, some uh, gaps. Majority of programs on um, uh, mental health and psychosocial support are seen as and delivered through the lens of public health or humanitarian. What we've seen is that trauma affects the ways that individuals, communities and organizations function and organize themselves. It can change the ways in which people understand human relationship and how they relate to other groups. It can generate a cycle of violence fueled by feelings of anger and humiliation. It can create a narrative of victimhood and persecution, which is passed on through generations. And the focus of psychosocial and trauma-focused work is usually on individual healing and on rebuilding trusts and relationships. It may include efforts to repair the damage to the social fabric, creating a context in which well-being is more likely to be protected and nurtured, and peace building and development initiatives are more possible. But violent conflicts and the psychosocial, psychological wounds which are, um, which are resulting from it are situated in a very complex context where there are likely to be multiple issues that are causing those distress. And these are, for example, social exclusion, economic injustice, gender inequality. So any intervention feeds back into this context. And if it is to be sustainable and transformative, it has to have an impact both on individuals and the wider context. So a failure to look at the structural inequalities, which were the preconditions for individual suffering, will mean that cycles of violence are unlikely to be interrupted and that work toward healing will be undermined. So it's a huge topic for, for all of us, but in this occasion, we would like to draw your attention to two points that we want to make. The first one is to make a case for integrating mental health and psychosocial support work into peace building work, making peace building trauma sensitive. And we will do that by exploring and assessing the connections between mental health and peace building outcomes. And the second one is to explore the role of narratives in healing process, especially in rebuilding social ties. So this session is organized jointly by International Alert and CIPRI. International Alert is a peace building organization and has been working for over 30 years to build positive peace and reduce violence, working across conflict lines and with all parties to conflict. CIPRI, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, is an independent international institute dedicated to research into conflict, armaments, arms control and disarmament, and for more than 50 years provides data, analysis and recommendations on issues of conflict and peace. And today we will hear from practitioners, academics and artists who will help us reflecting together on this topic 
and will share their case studies, research findings, and their approaches. And they are Mary Huere from International Alert, leading Alert's Northeast Nigeria portfolio, including integrating gender, social inclusion, and psychosocial support into programming. And she will share a case study from Northeast Nigeria on psychosocial support in peace building. We also have with us Lena Merhej, co-founder of Samandal, Alert's partner organization in Lebanon, organization which is dedicated to the advancement of the art of comics in Lebanon and broader. Using storytelling, Samandal offers an alternative platform of expression for cultural and social issues. We also have with us Tobias Hackett. Tobias is assistant professor of clinical developmental psychopathology and research group leader at Bielefeld University in Germany. Tobias will share his trauma research findings and discuss why mental health is precondition for peace building. Leading a discussion with our panelists and facilitating questions and answer session after our three presentation will be Ruth Simpson from International Alert, country director in Lebanon. My name is Vesna Matovic and I'm head of peace building training and learning at Alert and I will be a session moderator. After this short introduction, we will have an interactive workshop starting with three presentation from, presentations from our contributors and then we will have time for discussion with panelists and you can engage by posting your questions and comments in the chat room. We will finish with a short recap and some thoughts about what needs to happen next. You, I'm asking you to bear with us if we have any technical difficulties. We are calling in from all sorts of different parts of the world and in some places the connection might not be so great. So we will start now and I will invite Lena to start with her um, presentation and her input. Uh, good morning and uh, um, hello. Thank you for um, uh, giving me this opportunity to share with you um, some of my thoughts on Lena, we can't hear you. So can you hear me now? Sorry. Yes, thank you. Good. Oh, thank you, Vesna. Um, uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. And uh, hello. Um, I'm happy to have been given this opportunity to speak about uh, um, how to channel or um, what are the different ways to channel trauma and uh, um, anxiety through um, uh, stories, particularly comics, uh, so drawings and story, sto drawn stories. Um, I will turn off my camera so that uh, it's uh, more smooth. Uh, I'm speaking from Lebanon and there's a storm, so it's a little, the connection is a little bit uh, bad. So um, in the presentation, what I have here uh, so far is a, a new heroine that I've created after the explosion in Beirut uh, in August uh, 2020. And uh, uh, this uh, woman is called Maya and she's above uh, 40 and she's struggling uh, to maintain a balance. Um, here I'm drawing her doing yoga. Uh, calling for um, uh, saying you know, that this is one of the ways to to find uh, uh, calmness and uh, peace in order to start uh, healing. Uh, she's wearing uh, the Lebanese flag and the cedar is uh, right on her crotch, uh, which um, might be um, uh, thought to be like the blood. Uh, Lebanon, the cedars, we are all bleeding at this point. Um, I, I, I started uh, encouraged by my mother, who is a, a, um, 
uh, psychiatrist, psychi psychi child psychiatrist, my sister, who is also uh, interested in psychology and also uh, Steiner communities that um, invite uh, individual to look into nature and to listen to the body and all of this. And uh, being surrounded in a family like this and having uh, lived the war in Lebanon, of course, I had um, experienced uh, several traumas. And at uh, 26, I found myself with uh, a lot of uh, uh, um, anxiety disorders, um, including uh, uh, um, uh, anxiety crisis and all of this. And I was encouraged by my therapist to take down notes. And from these notes, I developed a book. And the book uh, is really about my relationship with my mother. So here, these are some images that uh, explain, you know, I, uh, it's in French, so I'll try to read it for you in English. But before this, I just want to make sure, is everybody uh, hearing me okay? It's Perfect. very good, Lena, thank you. Thank you. So I was trying to understand what I wanted. Um, of course, I had anxiety. I didn't know where it was coming from. Suddenly, my heart was beating. I felt like maybe I, I was going to die. I, I felt that th there was something not uh, going right in my body. And it was difficult to really um, accept first. So uh, I went to see a, a therapist. And uh, uh, these are, of course, um, uh, um, panels that I took from uh, from the book. So I went to a research and this research um, uh, coincided with a time when I was uh, uh, starting to publish comics with a few friends uh, where we where um, we started Samandal and Samandal is a is a comic book collective that we started in Lebanon in 2007 right after the 2006 uh, Israeli attack on Lebanon. So the Lebanese, we were really tired, especially my generation who uh, re-experienced uh, the war 10 years later uh, in, in, in its adulthood. So we lived the war in our childhood and then in 2006, we were young adults and um, all the memories of war uh, were coming back uh, from this, uh, this, uh, this war. Uh, so for this, we decided to create a space where we could uh, uh, publish comics, which was not available at that time. And we thought that we wanted really something that uh, that uh, is a platform where stories from all over the world, not only Lebanon, not only the Arab countries, could be published, but also not only in Arabic, in English and in French and other languages as well. So um, after in, in 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 the comics, I I show exactly you know the the time when I was feeling very secluded, um, the 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 pain that I felt and uh, the the anger that I felt uh, and how my uh, therapist uh, tried to appease me and try to um, uh, reconcile me with my mother. So here, this is an image where I'm asking my mother, could you come with me to the therapist next time? And for her, um, uh, even though she was a psychologist, it was difficult uh, when your own daughter asked you to go to a therapist. So it was also a process. Um, I think until today, it's still a process. So here, this is um, an idea, Vesna, that you've mentioned. Uh, the trauma that is um, uh, inherited from generation to generation uh, turned out that also my mother um, had uh, similar traumas like me and also she wanted to talk uh, about her um, experiences. So that, uh, that experience, writing about her, uh, it gave, it opened a lot of uh, different debates between us and different things to, to discuss. <clears throat> So um, with the, with Samandal, um, we wanted to do something. So we were four uh, co-founders. Uh, now we are 12. We have been um, um, quite active um, with, uh, with doing uh, different workshops, creating a community around comics, 
our our aim our mission was really to create a community so with that we were teaching and we were bringing people to teach us uh, we were inviting artists to come and share their work um and uh, until today we are doing um we, uh, let's say in in december we did a workshop with uh, with unesco uh, a three three work weeks workshop in the schools of lebanon particularly the schools that were um, uh, damaged by the explosion. And we gave them three different workshops, one that is related to comics, another one related to animation, and another one related to uh, graphic design, which are really the jobs that our artists do. So our artists, of course, we have the active members, but we reach out all over Lebanon for different artists, uh, uh, all related to illustration and printmaking. Um, uh, of course, we do publications as well, and we invite artists to send their work. Uh, so these are kind of anthologies. We have about uh, 26 publications today. It's been um, yeah, since 2007, so I don't know, maybe 14 years now. Uh, that we have published. Um, now we are doing a collection for the youth in Arabic so that we can provide comics for the youth in Arabic, something that is still rare, particularly as a form in the form of books. So you have in magazines, but kids, um, uh, Arab kids or kids reading Arabic cannot find a lot of comics, uh, comic books to read. So we are um, we are developing now. We have seven stories. We still have another, and they are online uh, for free. So encouraging uh, different youth, to, to, yeah, encouraging um, reading. And the stories come from different uh, different backgrounds. But uh, we had a competition, and we called for stories of uh, from teenagers. So we had a competition where a teenager. Uh, was uh, writing a scenario for, for one of our stories. We had also stories of struggle. So we wanted also um, uh, um, participants in the co competition to share stories of, of how they uh, struggled with something and overcame it. So we have a story like this um, um, about uh, two uh, twins who go to, to the school and they struggle because it's a new school. Um, and um, with, the, with, with Samandal, what I was able to do is really to um, um, uh, breathe, to put all the things that uh, really annoyed me and uh, that I was really, really angry about. And this is from a piece uh, um, called Manal and Ala, and this is about Ala Abdel Fattah, a friend of mine who is in prison in Egypt. And all I wanted to do is really uh, show the how what the, the poverty that is happening in Egypt and um, all the all the yes, I mean try to exaggerate it. I think this was really a start of uh, of something else uh, that I started to work on. But uh, this is another example of of um, how to use my drawings to express anger. So this was uh, this came after um, 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 an, um, a censorship that happened to Samandal that was related to religion. And uh, in the piece, I speak about you know uh, what are the different ways to speak about religion and what can we do with the imagery with religious images and uh, uh, how can we use them to communicate uh, better. In this case, it was to protest um, um, violence and in, in swear words that the Lebanese use. So in the end, I, I tried to consolidate uh, Muslim and Christian uh, uh, iconography or uh, religious uh, visuals and put them together in one page and to um, um, accuse the violence that was behind the, the bad words. Um, at this point, um, in my work, I've been doing a lot of uh, 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 work that is uh, soothing or if you want secure. So I based myself a lot on photos uh, and I um, 
kind of trace above the photos. So the photo for me is like a safety net. It helps me to start something. It gives me um, it gives me a security. So this is a work um, that is uh, that started uh, after the crisis in Beirut. Um, it's still uh, it's a narrative that is very ambiguous, and even I don't understand it. And I think that uh, one of the healing uh, process is to really make a make a proper. Um, uh, narrative that is understandable and uh, uh, try to resolve all the ambiguities in, in the narrative I'm working. So, I mean, one of the things that I've, I've been doing is throwing myself on uh, drawing uh, uh, different uh, um, detailed houses and going through all the city and trying to um, uh, imagine each neighborhood uh, this is, of course, um, a small image of the version, but uh, um, I think we can really zoom in and see the level of the details that I've added, uh, thinking about uh, each building. So this is the American University here. This is the old house, house I was living in. I'm living... So going through also the, the space and drawing it, uh, it, wa it was a kind of a healing. So here... Sorry. I want to show you another picture of Beirut, which I've drawn uh, to explain a little bit uh, how the image. So this is, of course, traced from an image and the image itself. It gave me a security to be able to draw the, the spaces I want to revisit in Beirut and to kind of uh, uh, make a, to heal from the pain that uh, that happened. I was not in Beirut during the explosion. So it was all a, um, a very um, a black hole in my head. I couldn't see, I was seeing black all the time and I couldn't imagine what was going on in Beirut. And for this, I had to draw it and I had to draw it several times with this level of details. Um, now I'm going to show you some of the works I've done. Uh, and this is also as a, a, um, a personal healing because uh, uh, drawing uh, these people, it brings me closer to them. It makes me understand what are the, the conditions they are living. Uh, it makes me feel with them. And uh, mostly it uh, gives me the power to express how also they are feeling to other people who will see this image. Um, so this is an image of uh, a building where there were refugees in Beirut and uh, it's a building that is not equipped. There are no maintenance, even though they are paying the rent. Uh, but of course, um, uh, they are not uh, uh, protected. Uh, and uh, there are uh, Syrian and Bangladeshi um, uh, refugees who all got caught uh, COVID at the same time. So it was a very critical time for them a uh, very difficult place, uh, uh, time, and important to um, to show the rest of the city what was going on in this huge building. Um, now, uh, I'm going to show you a series uh, of, uh, now this is in English, so I got it so that because uh, I, I will be able to show it. Um, so this is uh, Maya, the, the heroine that I showed you in the beginning. And I, I, I thought that um, uh, during the crisis, I turned 41 and I thought, well, at 40, uh, of course, uh, they, they say there's a crisis at 40. Uh, in my 40s, there was a revolution in my country and um, there was a revolution in my heart. I was going to the, to the street, I was protesting and uh, there was all these things that were turning in, my, in, my, uh, in me. And uh, with a friend, Joel Hatem, we decided to create a character that would uh, uh, impersonate all these uh, things that would happen to a woman uh, in Beirut uh, during this time. So here, um, Maya is going up to her room and up to her house, and someone uh, uh, sends her a message, and she sees the explosion, uh, the, uh, the first explosion in Beirut. And then the second explosion uh, happened, and she is uh, thrown by her mattress. Her mattress throws her to the to the wall. She's uh, she hates this mattress, and um, uh, because it carries so many different uh, memories, 
it's where uh, she had her first fight with Rula and Maher and, and Salim. And the phone is still ringing. Uh, so everybody's calling also in this difficult time because to see if, if she's alive or not. So, Ma so Zena is calling, hello. And um, here, uh, um, the, the, the expression of the trauma is that the, is, is with the, uh, she's obsessed with the mattress instead of, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, being obsessed with what happened to her, her body. It's really the mattress that was, re uh, in this case, um, uh, torn and uh, destroyed, so gone. Um, but mostly I wanted to show you this piece, which we, which we made together, Joelle and I, where we had two parallel narratives. One of the narratives uh, uh, discussed in Lebanon was um, that us Lebanese, we are tired, we are so tired of um, uh, resilience. We don't want to be resilient, uh, we, are, we have enough of resilience uh, because the resilience have led us to um, uh, accept our situation and not uh, uh, try to change it. Um, so at this point, we were thinking that uh, personal resilience is very important and taking care of oneself is, is very, very important. So we made a parallel with what was happening and all the horrible things that are happening to Lebanon between the, the civil war to now the crisis and, uh, and all the different problems uh, with uh, um, Maya trying to masturbate and trying to find some kind of of uh, um, uh, uh, somewhere out of all of this. So she, she goes through uh, trying different ways, uh, even imagining that she is uh, um, with her um, therapist. So also highlighting the fact that uh, she is going through a therapist, uh, she is doing a work um, to uh, to um, uh, face or to get to get uh, through this uh, difficult times. Okay, Lena. Yes. Um, just finish the what, what you started, and then we will need to move to another presentation. So if you can slowly Thank wrap you. up. Yes, I will finish with this one, and this is a, a piece that I'm working on now, and just to show to show you that. Um, Poetry, um, in the end, is something that I found uh, very, um, um, uh, it brings me a lot of peace. And um, yes, I'm throwing myself into poetry at this point, uh, also with uh, uh, historical works. And uh, I think this brings me some kind of a, a resilience at this point. Um, um, so this is the point where I am. Uh, I'm, I know that the healing is a complete uh, is a process. Uh, uh, I think that the Lebanese in general, uh, we need a, a collective uh, therapy uh, to work on our collective traumas. Um, I hope that, uh, yes, eventually we will be able to find uh, a way out of all of this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lana. This is such a powerful story, personal and, and collective, as you said. It's not only about our own personal stress and traumas, but also how do we deal with our collective wounds. Thank you so much for sharing, and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions from the audience to engage and to see how they can benefit and how they can use what you explained in their own work. Thank you again. And now we will uh, we will go to Mary, and Mary will uh, present a case study from Northeast Nigeria. So, Mary, welcome. Good evening, everyone from Northeast Nigeria. My name is Mary Ferre. Um, I'm the Northeast Program Manager and I'm based in Borno State. I'm best naive present. Are you projecting the slide? I'm just uh, that. Uh, oh, let me see if I can click on my end. Sorry. Yeah. Are we good? Is it all right? Yes. So 
I'm very happy to be here um, this evening to um, tell you a very interesting story about the work we do um, here in Northeast Nigeria, specifically on how we integrate mental health and psychosocial support in our peace building and work. Um, but just a little bit of um, background to the Northeast context. Um, so the conflict in the Northeast, as most of you will know, is in its 13th year. It began in 2009 um, and in 2009 with, with um, a jihadist um, insurgent group um, who declared that um, who declared their goal to Islamize um, Nigeria, and of course, starting from the Northeast Nigeria, specifically Bordeaux, Adamawa, and Yobe State. And so in 2013, the government of Nigeria, in response, um, in 2013, the government of Nigeria in response um, declared a state of emergency in the Northeast Nigeria, which technically means that um, when they launched um, an offensive um, against the insurgents from 2019. And so um, that conflict has caused a lot of um, people being killed, um, a lot of displacements. And we have a lot of people living in IDP camps and host communities. And some have moved to neighboring Lake Chad, basin to live with family, friends or relatives. Um, so those who have survived this violence um, are often left with um, either a physical injury. So you either meet someone who has lost an arm, who um, is carrying a physical scar on his or her body, or you meet people who are traumatized. So basically the conflict in the Northeast, I mean, you meet people who have been either directly or indirectly impacted by this conflict. Um, so the, the, the conflict has had um, some impact on the, the mental health of um, people, um, most people in the Northeast. Um, you have people who go through, who experience trauma basically from the things they see. Um, People have seen dead bodies. Um, they've seen, for example, their houses being burned. Um, for some, they, they get traumatized from what they hear. They hear screaming, people screaming. Um, they hear very depressing stories around um, Sometimes they hear things like, oh, Boko Haram is coming. You know, so, so that also um, triggers um, some trauma. Some of them hear explosive um, devices. And then for some, um, it comes as a result of what they do. Um, we have had cases where people have been coerced to killing family members or killing um, their neighbors um, as a result of um, during the insurgency, while you have people who have willingly um, been able to um, carry out um, atrocities. So that comes back to haunt them. And of course, trauma as a result of people's experience. Um, we've had cases of men who experience their sons raping their wives, and then in some cases killing them, while in some cases um, the, the, the sons after raping their mothers, they, they marry the mother. So that these are some of the sources of trauma that we, we see in the space that we work in. And then we've seen that um, these symptoms are expressed in different levels and Lena has actually mentioned even from her own personal experiences. 
about um, some of the symptoms of trauma. So at individual level, for example, you have people who become very paranoid, um, they become isolated, um, they become very aggressive. Um, then at the family level, for example, we've had cases of, um, say for example, head of households like the men, for example, who as a result of trauma, engage in excessive um, consumption of alcohol or abuse of drugs. And so they come back home and then beat their wives and children. So that also is, um, so that trauma is causing conflict within the household. Then of course, we've seen how trauma causes conflict even within the community. Um, for example, a community member um, knows that it's a particular tribe who has killed um, his or her family member or loved one. So each time he or she sees that um, community member, it brings back the memory, it brings out back the trauma, and then you see them, you see it manifesting in some ways, for example, excessive quarrel, or in, in, in my own opinion, sometimes unnecessary quarrel, even in um, water point. And so, um, based on um, this background, um, so for us, International Alert, as, as a peace building organization, our vision is that people and their societies can resolve their conflicts, their differences without resulting into conflict, and that despite their differences, they can be able to um, resolve their, their conflict um, without resulting into violence. So, um, for, as an organization, we conducted in Nigeria, we conducted a research in 2015 called the Bad Blood Research. And the research um, aims at, um, it's called Bad Blood Research. And the research showed that there's a lot of rejection, stigma, and additional trauma to returnees as a result of the conflict that they experience. The research also shows that lack of reintegration damages social cohesion and prospects for long-term peace. And then thirdly, the research shows that rejection may push some women and girls to return to the bush, um, thereby perpetrating um, conflict. So on this return, return of um, these um, survivors to the bush, they, um, because of the, 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 the stigmatization that some of them face, they feel more loved even by the insurgents. So um, they, some of them uh, return to the, to the bush. And sadly, um, this is still currently happening in some of the communities in which we, we work in. Um, so, we, as a result of the research, we launched um, the research informs um, the program strategy of one of our interventions, which aims to um, increase a, a reintegration and resilience of women and girls who have been affected by um, the Boko Haram conflict. And um, we use um, some of the approaches that we use in our work is capacity building. So some of the pictures you see, um, the picture with the man standing is from an internally displaced camp um, where one of the trained um, leaders is um, training the community. So our, as an organization, we provide capacity building for staff, for um, religious and community leaders, for relevant government ministries, departments and agents that we work with. Um, as well as um, the community-based mechanisms that exist in, in, in some communities. So in some communities, you find out that they have already traditional um, structures where they address their conflict. And then for some, those structures exist, but they are weak, so we try to strengthen them. And some, in some communities, they do not exist at all. So what we do is to try to establish some of those communities. So we train them and try to increase their understanding on how to, how to mainstream um, mental health and psychosocial support in their interventions. 
We train them on conflict and gender sensitivity and on um, mediation. And um, during our training, so we have a, a training manual that is context specific. Um, some of the some of the topics on this in this training manual includes um, forgiveness. It includes um, how to, to to manage grief um, because most of the participants that we work with are traumatized. And um, one of the reasons why we put that um, why we have the module of forgiveness in our training manual is because of the context in which we work in. So Nigeria is more of a religious, is highly religious. And so as any interventions you do to be accepted needs to have some form of religious coloration to it. And so um, forgiveness appeals to the religion and the, the religious beliefs of the two major religions um, in the context in which we work, which is um, Christianity and, 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 and Islam. And so, from the um, so forgiveness, we try to make them understand what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not, and then also making them to understand that forgiveness, for example, is for their, your benefit as an individual, and it doesn't necessarily mean that the perpetrator is going to go unpunished. And because we have different um, categories of um, participants during our training, mostly uneducated. We use practical sessions during our, our, our um, trainings. Um, so I'll just give an example of one of the sessions. And um, so for example, to buttress um, the importance of forgiveness or why, how harmful forgiveness can be to the individual, we do a practical session where we ask the participants to all carry stones and put in their shoes. And then they walk with the stones for like five, 10 minutes. And we can all imagine how uncomfortable this can be and how hurting it can be. After, so after walking with the stones, um, they're asked to remove the stones from their legs. And then you hear or you see different expressions, feelings basically um, relief. And so we use that to say, that is how forgiveness works, that forgiveness is for you as an individual, um, not for the perpetrator. And so um, it's important for us to include some of these models, um, models in our training because um, if beneficiaries are angry, they do not, and we invite them for our dialogue sessions, they will not be able to make contributions. They will just be there mostly um, for some to just get the transport stipends or um, the, the refreshment. Um, and then of course, we also train staff on trauma-informed care as well. Evidence Generation Week um, is also one of our approach to the work we do. Um, we conduct a rapid assessment to be able to understand the psychological um, distress of um, the beneficiaries we work with. And then from there, develop a care plan for, um, for those cases that are very, um, that require referral or specialized services. We now make referral to the relevant um, actors. Um, and then again, this assessment provides a basis for us to monitor the work we do and be able to, over time, be able to um, know the, the improvement. So the beneficiaries we work with, for example, express their inability to sleep and having nightmares during their sleep um, during our sessions. So over time, we try to monitor that to see whether or not they are making an improvement or not. So that's one of the strategies we use. And then we also do um, advocacy and influencing. Um, to the left now, I don't know if it's to your right, but we have um, the Commissioner of Women Affairs uh, with a large team um, where they went to um, conduct some advocacy to um, the ministry as well as um, to the Ministry of um, Reconciliation and um, Ministry of Reconciliation and Resettlement in the in Borno State where we solicit for their support and then we try to um, influence to a large extent their policy on reintegration. Um, very quickly, um, we also do dialogue. Um, you can see some of the dialogue sessions that we, we, we conduct in communities. 
I see Vesna smiling. I'll soon round up, please. And then we also um, have um, social cultural activities. As you can see, um, this is um, a group of women um, doing a play session, uh, session. And then we also do a lot of um, arts, like Lena talked about her arts um, with, the, with, the, with the children, and of course, um, media. So after all this intervention, our impact. From the work we have done, um, from the evaluations um, that we conducted, we've seen that um, we've seen a more resilient um, group of people. You can see the young children from the Peace Club activities um, expressing joy. Now, some of those children were initially stigmatized by their own peers, but as a result of our activities, they have been able to embrace peace. And then the young man here really proudly leading his team um, in a dance competition in, within the context. And then we see this woman leader speaking very passionately about um, the work she does and then encouraging um, community, um, um, social cohesion in the community. Um, some of the pictures of our work. And then my last slide. <laughs> And so, in summary, some of our impact um, we, we have with that we've, um, families have welcomed survivors back into their homes and treated them with greater compassion. Some of the families that benefited from the program activities have volunteered themselves as reference points to continue to provide counseling to those families still having these difficulties in accepting survivors. And for us, that uh, ensures, that assures us of, of the sustainability of the intervention. Then we've seen that attitude towards female survivors from fellow women and girls who previous um, harbored feelings of fear and mistrust have changed positively. They are now more understanding and empathetic to um, survivors. And lastly, survivors and community women and girls um, began to interact positively in the community and they have created their own independent peer-to-peer -peer counseling sessions and are socializing together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mary. That was really, it is really important work and not easy work to be done. And maybe um, at some point in discussion, you, you can maybe also uh, talk a little bit about, do you have any systems or processes in place, how to help your staff with involved in such a difficult work. How do you care of yourself? But for now, thank you. And we are now going to uh, hear from Tobias. Tobias, um, it's your time to give us your thoughts. Thank you very much. Hi to everyone. Though I can't see the participants, um, I see that there are many. It's uh, a pleasure to be here with you. So I'm a uh, psychologist by background, psychologist and psychotherapist and a trauma researcher. So as a background, I come from the individual perspective, but in this panel, I want to look at um, trauma and trauma therapy, that um, how this affects uh, people or how this helps people beyond um, the individual clinical symptoms. I'm based in Germany um, at University of Bielefeld, and um, at the same time, I work for Vivo International. This is an NGO that tries to put evidence-based trauma um, therapy to people affected by war and conflict. So I apologize, I'm a researcher, so I will present numbers, um, but I tried to limit this. Um, let's go now. So when we talk about trauma, um, in war and conflict, um, there's one phenomenon that is quite important. It's not very new. It's called the building block effect. And the building block effect just says that the more different types of traumatic experiences you experience in your life, the more um, increases your PTSD risk. And as you know, post-traumatic stress disorder is one of the uh, most common uh, mental health consequences of uh, war and conflict, and as a result of life-threatening events. So as you can imagine, in conflict settings, it's never 
only one or two traumatic experiences you encounter, encounter, but it's a number of these different types of traumatic experiences, and this puts um, the individual risk of experiencing PTSD um, quite high. And um, a post-traumatic stress disorder, as you may know, has three core symptom clusters. And um, this may not be new to you, but I want to stress that um, the hyper arousal part of it, um, this is being very alert, being very attentive to danger, but also being threatened easily by any kind of um, surprise or interruption. This also has a huge impact on how you interact with people. So it um, affects social relationships. So as one of the core symptoms, we have this um, problem of interacting with people. And this, of course, um, as part of the clinical problems, um, can also um, be a factor that um, hinders um, so peace building activities or the capacity of people um, to reconciliate. So um, when we look at PTSD, then we see that it's not only a mental health issue, but it's something that really um, affects the daily activities. So with PTSD symptoms, for example, reliving um, what you have experienced, this takes a lot of time of you and the capacity of um, your memory, the capacity of your executive functioning. And this affects then like basic um, tasks on the one hand. So um, it's not just the suffering in the sense of um, having nightmares, but it really affects um, your income raising activities or your daily activities um, with your family looking at after your kids. At the same time, due to the hyper arousal that I mentioned, there's also it's the path down here. Um, it increases the risk of reacting aggressively to um, situations that stress you out. So, for example, also when um, you are looking after the kids and they do not do what you want, then the likelihood of um, reacting more aggressively um, is uh, much higher. So um, these are, again, um, empirical evidence for this hypothesis that um, PTSD affects social relationships. But even more than this, so we looked at this in a study with um, Burundian refugees, um, and we wanted to see how um, social capital is affected um, by um, war exposure or traumatic events and also by post-traumatic stress symptoms. And what do I mean with um, social capital? So social capital is actually something um, that is quite um, important um, in a functioning society. So it's the general trust in other people of your community. It's the active involvement into community work or community meetings and it's your social support network and all this is directly but for us more importantly indirectly affected via post-traumatic stress symptoms and so here we can see that mental health problems especially post-traumatic stress symptoms go far beyond the individual suffering but um, also affect the social bonds and the social functioning of a community. And the more people are, who are affected at the same time, um, of course, um, increase um, the problem. So knowing this, the question is, what do we do about it? And as I said, I'm a clinical psychologist and psychotherapist. The natural way how I look at this is um, let's start treating the symptoms. If we treat the trauma symptoms, it, this should also have an effect on um, the social relations. So the approach that I'm using in my work is called narrative exposure therapy. It's a trauma-focused therapy and it's an evidence-based trauma-focused therapy that has been tested in different populations and has been specifically um, developed for people who are suffering uh, multiple traumas and um, 
are affected, for example, by um, war and conflict. Um, I don't have the time to um, go into detail, but basically it uses the life story of a person, including all the traumatic events and reliving them in a um, secure or safe context um, to heal um, the experiences. The idea is um, with PTSD, this is um, like a problem of feeling under threat, though what has happened was in the past, it feels like it's still ongoing. And with the therapy, we try to put it into the context, something that happened in the past that was very um, bad for the people, and uh, but it's not a threat right now, um, is the basic idea. And already one of the first studies that um, looked at the effectiveness, um, showed something very interesting. And this was um, kind of a coincident or a side effect, but this was quite interesting um, because, so there was a reduction of PTSD symptoms, no less depressive symptoms, but also those who were treated with narrative exposure therapy in a refugee camp setting, they managed to leave the refugee um, camp setting and they moved to more safe and fertile places, they were able to look for jobs. So this is a sign that besides reducing clinical symptoms, um, there was also more functioning. So they were um, better in taking decisions for their life. And this um, already says something about um, the effect besides reducing clinical symptoms. In um, another project that I was involved in, in the DR Congo, we extended narrative exposure therapy for the work with um, former child soldiers. And the difference with former child soldiers is they are, of course, victims of violence and have experienced a lot of traumatic experience. But at the same time, they have also perpetrated um, quite um, violent acts to others. And the idea of this extended version of narrative exposure therapy is um, looking at both um, the perpetrated violence and also the experienced violence. I don't go into the details here, but what I wanted to show is that, um, again, it reduced PTSD symptoms. It has also a positive effect on aggression. But again, as a secondary outcome, we could show that those, um, this is like a controlled um, study, so uh, RCT, um, that looked at um, how much they were in touch with their former armed groups. So the likelihood of um, voluntary return to the groups. And we could see that we have an interaction effect. So the ones that were um, treated with Fornet, um, they were less likely um, to be in touch with their former combatants. And so they were less likely to return to the groups. And this um, is the effect beyond the clinical symptoms. We did this first in a very small trial, um, but then in a second trial, um, so with narrative exposure therapy, we always have the aim that um, it's easy to train local um, health workers also in narrative exposure therapy. So we have here a dissemination study where um, trained therapists, um, but local trained therapists conducted um, the studies. So it's the phase two study. And again, of we have our sim findings that symptoms were reduced, but for us here, um, the interesting part is that we also could show um, positive um, effects on the economic reintegration. And also again, as we did before, um, at least in, in, in one of the um, phases or in one of the groups to the um, connection to the paramilitary life. So we replicated more or less what I just um, presented before. Um, and the 
like the take home message that I wanted to stress here is that um, in our research, we can show that war trauma affects the psychosocial functioning far beyond mental health. So um, the secondary effects of trauma are affecting the social bonds. And then it's um, via post-traumatic stress symptoms that social interaction actions and the functioning is um, affected. But on the other hand, if we treat these symptoms, then um, we can also reverse it. So the treatment of the, the trauma-focused treatment that aims to reduce PTSD symptoms has the same side effects or positive effects then on um, the social functioning. And this is, I mean, I'm coming from the clinical psychology where we always work with individuals, so very different uh, from the other speakers. Um, but for us, it's quite an important understanding that we say, okay, um, it's mental health that needs to be in order or the people need to have good mental health to be able um, to contribute um, to community activities. So the first step is um, to look at mental health or trauma um, steps um, to make people um, able to um, integrate or um, or function in um, in a society. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Tobias. Very interesting presentation and very optimistic looking findings. So by working with individuals, you can actually have the impact on, on, on communities and broader society. So that's very good to know. Uh, now it's time for our the, the discussion and I will hand over to Ruth to lead the discussion with our panelists. And for you, for the, the rest of you, can you please, if you have any questions or comments, put it in, uh, in, in the chat room and we will, we will um, uh, read and address those. Thanks a lot, Vesmera. Thanks to all the speakers for um, some really uh, interesting presentations looking both at the personal, the individual and um, societal uh, issues related to uh, dealing with trauma, uh, mental health uh, in, in conflict affected contexts. So I just have a couple of questions um, to get the ball rolling for the Q&A, but please uh, do um, add in your questions to uh the chat room as well so lena to you first um in in terms of you spoke about your personal experience um using uh art and, and comics to to work through and, and process your own um trauma um from your work building a community uh in lebanon um around this how would you say that comics and, and storytelling can help young people address uh, their trauma in a broader way. Well, I think uh, today uh, we rely a lot on the image. Uh, we are sleeping with uh, Instagram and waking up with TikTok. So images, they really are kind of a tool that we use. And I think uh, with comics, since it's, uh, it's an exercise to put text and words together, I think already the the attempt to first uh, put in words and then the attempt to visualize and the combination between them has a lot of space for um, for um, expre if, if, if expression if you want so you can express something without uh, not really directly with an image uh, you you can you don't have to say it directly so images can help us to 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 map out if you want uh, uh, the lives. I think that yes. When I when I think about uh, Tobias' uh, uh, suggestion to write the the life uh, of the people who had trauma, uh, it's an exercise that I do often with uh, with my students or with in workshops where we lay out all the different uh, steps that. Uh, uh, mattered in our lives and uh, 
we, we start to think about them or we ask them to bring in uh, objects that are related to this and to rebuild uh, from these objects by drawing them, by writing about them, um, something. I think that what is important here is a starting point. It's very difficult for people to start with, a, with an empty page uh, like this and uh, to invite them to, to start putting things on, on paper, whether it's a drawing or a text, there has to be something, one, one thing if you want. And I use sometimes a photo or I ask them to bring a photo or um, I, I bring a collection of different comics and uh, we can cut them and use them. So also I think with, with, uh, with uh, telling the story, there should be something um, uh, given given that uh, facilitates this uh, uh, the stream of thought if you want or the, the stream of telling uh, and drawing did i ask you uh, answer your question <laughs> yes thank you lenny you did uh and mary um thinking about the work that you do in in northeast nigeria um working with communities um rebuilding how do you see the work that you've done integrating uh, trauma healing comparing to um, other interventions that don't have such a strong trauma or mental health component? Um, thanks. Um, so for us, um, we haven't, um, as, an, as, a, as a program or country program, we haven't um, conducted a research to verify um, this. Um, so most of my response, I would say, is anecdotal. It's based on um, the discussions we had with the teams and then from the feedback we got from community members, from our implementing partners, and as well as um, some of the community volunteers that we work with. Um, so we have um, how we can, in our own way, um, determine that um, the outcomes of these interventions um, when being mainstreamed with um, MHPSS um, are, are more or is more sustainable um, is um, we compared the project on reintegration of women and girls who were adopted by Boko Haram and then we compared our other projects that have no components of MHPSS. For example, we have a project on preventing and countering violent extremism um, in the Northeast in targeted local government, where we worked directly with youth. So there was um, no component of um, MHPSS. And so one strategy that is consistent across our programming, for example, is dialogue sessions. And um, so during the dialogue sessions, um, we have um, more people who are more um relaxed and um, during conversation we don't get as much heated debates um, from the sessions where we integrate mphpss compared to that which we do not um mainstream mphpss and then secondly we also during a reflection session with the team and partners we also one of the the, the, the feedback was that community members in um, communities where we mainstream um, MHPSS feel they trust their leaders more and they find out that the leaders are more empathetic, they are, they are more empathetic, yes, to their, 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 their situations. And so helping them to be more open and then address more of their conflict. And so this, um, based on, on our own assessment, is as a result of the training where we bring into their consciousness the impact of trauma and how they can mainstream trauma even within dialogue sessions. And that's against um, the other sessions where we do not have any of those um, components. But um, Tobias also, I think from his presenta presentation, also demonstrated that there's clear um, evidence um, that um, mainstreaming and, and how uh, mainstreaming MPPSS contributes to more positive outcomes. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. And to both uh, you and, and Tobias, picking up on the question um, from Britt that she put in the chat. Um, uh, Britt says, uh, 
she's interested in the framing of mental health and trauma healing as supporting for forgiveness and reconciliation. Um, there's some evidence to suggest that fostering reconciliation some, can sometimes work at cross purposes to mental health outcomes. So she's interested to hear, and I thought perhaps um, both Mary, given the work that you do in Northeast Nigeria, has a component that focuses on forgiveness. There might be some anecdotal uh, evidence or experience from there, or perhaps Tobias um, from your research as well. So maybe go for Tobias first and then to Mary. Um, so from the psychological literature, um, I think the, the important step for um, like the link between forgiveness and uh, mental health is um, really like the um, compassion or that you have, like do the step for yourself. So if you overcome um, the the pressure that is uh, in you and you are able to forgive, even though there is nobody you you tell this, but you just do this in, um, in within the fa uh, therapy, then this has already a huge impact. So you don't need the perpetrators uh, to, con to be confronted with the perpetrator, but um, if you um, can just uh, do this within um, uh, therapy and um, then this is already effective and there is the link um, if you're ready to forgive then it has a positive impact on uh, mental health but it's um, it, it, it's a very individual um, whether this works or not because um, often um, survivors are not ready or it takes very long time for them to be able to forgive. Thanks Tobias. Mary do you have any thoughts? Yeah, just in addition to what Tobias has um, said, so for us, um, we, like I said, um, the context, um, because um, both the religions um, within the context um, preaches forgiveness, and so that approach already in the first place appeals to the people, and then um, everybody has their definition of what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not. So for one um, um, community member, forgiveness is ensuring that he sees the perpetrator in being brought to book. And then for another, he's just saying, oh, I let go. So um, we don't, um, we're not like, um, we try to make them understand that the essence of this topic is, is about you. Like forgiveness is for you. And that's why we brought out the example of working with the shoes um, to say that, okay, when you don't forget, forgive is still, an impact on you and then we're saying that um, we try to make them understand what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not and then of course to make it clear that forgiveness doesn't mean that you don't remember again and um, it probably just means that yeah you, you recall but you don't still feel that pain which you know it's it's toxic or like poisoned um, to, to you and so um, it's not like I mean it, it, it's it's a complex um, context, I must say, and so it's difficult sometimes to say exactly that. Um, oh, we, we, I mean, forgiveness works for some. It doesn't. I mean, it doesn't work for some, and so it all depends on the the individual you're working with. Wait, I hope <laughs> I answer your question. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. It's a complex one when we're working with individuals and how they interact with. Uh, complex environments. Um, so to bias, um, what we see from a lot of programming and research on trauma, conflict and peace building, we often see that it's focused on the individual. Um, yet we know it's important to consider the broader context, the structural issues that can drive conflict and contribute to trauma, which affects both individuals and communities. From your perspective, where do you see the gaps in the research? Um, when it comes to supporting ecosystems that are conducive to well-being, as well as to, to peace building outcomes. And then I think that links a bit, if it's not too much in one question, to a question in the chat about which measures, scales or evalu evaluation tools you use to link individual indicators of change to those broader societal ones. Yeah, so as I mentioned in um, the um, talk, of course, as a psychologist, we come from the individual level, but and we can also see that there is some impact that um, individual treatment has on, um, like on the community level. But the problem, of course, is that um, in um, 
context where like almost everyone experiences uh, traumatic experiences, for example, like Lebanon or the another Nigeria. Um, this is also like coming together with settings where there is not enough mental health services around. So the, the gap is that um, though there are effective individual treatments, um, it's difficult to offer them to, to all. And that's why also in, in one of our recent works, um, we try to look at what so what do we do in these contexts where we have um, entire communities being traumatized and does it work to work with narratives in the sense of narrative exposure therapy um, but not with individuals but with villages for example so can we use a common narrative that has like not an individual experience but almost everyone can we use this in a group session um, <clears throat> to work through it and um, use this as examples to um, use this as a healing instrument for the entire community. And uh, it's too early to say that it's really effective on a um, clinical level. So we always look first at the clinical level. Um, but I think this is um, the gap. The, um, individual treatment is just not possible to deliver to everyone in these settings. So um, even the group-based approaches are not um, like scalable. So if we have something like community approaches with narratives that could be a way forward. And then to the question um, you were referring to from the chat. Um, so uh, basically there are two questions to me. The one is uh, how do we know that it's due to the intervention and the other one, what scales do we need? And um, so from a researcher's perspective, always like the gold standard to know it's really due to our intervention is a controlled study. So we use two different types of research designs to answer these questions. One is a um, randomized controlled trial on an individual basis. This um, allows us to compare two groups that only differ whether they get an intervention or not. And then we know the only difference is having intervention or not. And then we know um, it's due to the intervention. But of course, when we ask um, like uh, effects on the community level, this is quite difficult because um, we could have like um, spillover effects. So we would use so-called cluster randomized controlled trials for this. So the level of randomization is not the individual, but it's, for example, the village or um, a refugee camp or a zone of a refugee camp. And so we would offer the treatment in one village, but not in the other, and they are a bit far apart, but otherwise they are quite similar. And so we can um, uh, determine that um, at baseline they are very similar in all our outcomes, but uh, at follow-up they aren't. And the question that is, how do we measure it? We have different ways to measure it. We use, of course, like self-report measures of individuals, but uh, we also use so-called um, second order um, information that we would collect on, um, um, on, on the level of um, communities. So asking what changed rates of uh, employment, for example, as one outcome measure or how, um, they interact with each other. And um, the other one, and this is quite interesting in, in research, is that we use um, kind of economic games. Um, so hypothetical ways of how to, so if you get like a task and you have money to distribute to different people, to whom would you distribute this? And this is um, more realistic on the one hand, but on the other hand, and people also know that um, and this may not be true. So we have different ways of measuring it, and um, they are all not perfect, but with having different ways, we try to come as close as possible to the truth because all of these are somehow biased. And with having different ways, we try to come as close as possible to what we want to. Thanks, Tobias. Um, to pick up on, a, on Rebecca's question in the chat and um, the broader question that we were considering uh, when we were planning this session, how do we help those that are helping others? So working in um, in these kind of contexts, dealing with trauma can compound uh, and create trauma in those um, seeking to support. Um, 
individuals and groups uh, dealing uh, with, with conflict and working on um, mental health and psychosocial support programs. So what can we do um, to support and motivate ourselves as, as peace builders and those working with um, people living in trauma uh, and potentially um, avoiding experiencing secondary trauma ourselves? So I think this is a, a question relevant to all, all members of the panel, perhaps um, starting with Lena. Yes, uh, Ruth, thank you. Having uh, lived the war as a child, when the war finished, I was a teenager. And uh, I was always wondering why um, there was no collective uh, therapy on, on TV. Why um, the, nobody cared about uh, yeah this part. Um, I think that uh, already uh, we have a problem with our narrative itself, uh, telling our history. Uh, censorship plays a role, but uh, I think that, uh, yes, um, the, the problem is we don't know our history. The youth today don't know the history of Lebanon, nor the history of the war, nor not what happened. Uh, nobody has a co coherent narrative. Everything is... Um, you know, uh, not said or said with other words, or uh, it has underlying. Uh, and I think the the for for me, it's calling for artists to create narratives, to write the history, to to share as many stories as possible until we reach this kind of a crystallized or I don't know if if several narratives is um, is. Uh, is good for one community who lives with uh, trauma. Maybe Tobias, you can help me. But I think yes, it's um, um, at this point. I think um, my interest in stories and stories is coming from that, from having being a teenager with no history about the war that I've lived as a child, and growing up as a young adult with that, with a with an empty void, or with a, they call it in Lebanon the the social amnesia so it's an amnesia that the government created due to a kind of a, 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 um, a law that was done uh, so that we end the war where nobody was uh, 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 guilty and nobody was the winner so everybody had to uh, agree with the status quo but of course um yes it, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's it's difficult, so. Thank you, Lena. Yeah, Tobias, do you have any thoughts from the research? Are there any studies that you can cite around secondary trauma? Well, secondary trauma occurs and um, also help seekers or help, uh, not seekers, help deliverers um, can develop PTSD symptoms. So this is um, something that's really important to consider. And um, of course, treatment is there and um, possible, but this is not the question. I think to look at the question is how to prevent um, um, secondary trauma. And um, we, in, uh, like uh, as psychotherapists, we learn quite a lot about psychohygiene and how we can deal with these difficult situations. And in the projects um, I work in, where we also train lay therapists, this is um, one of the important um, aspects that we focus on. Because if you work as a trauma therapist, you always hear this um, quite um, heavy stories. And um, it's the, the closer you are, um, to the context, the more it affects you because this could happen to you too. This could happen to your children. So this is quite threatening. And um, so it's very important to share these experience. How do you feel? And um, the more you disclose to other, others, um, just after you delivered a, a therapy session or when you come across um, a difficult situation, the more likely um, you do not develop any symptoms. So, and this has to do with our how our brain functions. So, PTSD symptoms or PTSD is mainly a, mer a memory disorder. And um, the more you can process it um, by wording it or speaking it out, the more likely you can put it in the right context right away. And this um, prevents developing PTSD symptoms. 
So um, speaking about it in a group of people with the same experiences is the best psycho hygiene um, and perhaps preventing PTSD symptoms. Thank you. Uh, Mary, it would be interesting to, to hear from you how how uh, the work in Nigeria um, deals with supporting those working with, with traumatized individuals and communities and also just uh, to pick up on a further question in the chat uh, for you is what happens when, when people are not ready to forgive um, how is that addressed in the program yeah. okay thanks um, so first I'll start with the last question when what happens when people are not ready to forgive I mean like I said we, we're all different individuals um, and so we we encourage forgiveness and we allow people to heal um in i mean as it suits them we understand the individual differences we can absolutely not force anybody to forgive and we're just saying that oh i mean based on abcd it's for your good you forgive and we also make them understand that we understand that this could take time um so that's um being said then for the question on um providing support to the team i've been in the northeast for over four years i have colleagues who have been here for longer and some are indigents and we used to think that we're very brave um very we're humanitarian workers we're very happy to do the work we do not realizing that we were all traumatized until we had our first training on trauma-informed care the whole team were crying some uncontrollably and so the facilitator had to even halt the training and we didn't realize that we're also traumatized or we're also experiencing vicarious trauma from the things we hear, like Tobias said. You hear unbelievable stories. A woman told me her husband, because I just noticed her during one of the dialogue sessions, she just sits down and then she just notes her head. Consecutively for three sessions, I noticed this woman. So one day I just told my colleague, I said, I want to speak with this woman. And she just said that each time we're having the dialogue that she said her husband was slaughtered on her lap and then she was asked to pull his body in a wheelbarrow. So even me hearing that too was also traumatizing to me. And so sometimes with my team, we go to the field, we expand from our personal pocket because you see meat on ground and you're moved with the human sympathy based on what you see and hear. So for us, I think um, having um, trauma-informed training for staff is very important. And then it should be done um, frequently. And for us, yes, we have, we have the first training. Sometimes we need to be reminded of what we know already. And then uh, we also try to do um, what we call happy hour, um, sometimes quarterly within the team. Maybe on Fridays, we just try to, to gather the team and then forget about the work and then talk about um, some positive aspects of life. Um, so that, in a way, um, has also helped staff to be able to cope with work. And lastly, I will say that um, we always tax every supervisor to be accountable to the team and to be very sensitive to a staff member who comes to work, for example, looking tired, looking um, um, depressed, you know. So even at, at every level, we have um, supervisors who are tasked with the responsibility of ensuring that their staff do not burn out and then provide the needed support. Thank you. Thanks, Mary, and th thanks to all the panelists for um, your insights uh, following um, the questions from, from participants. I think we can see across diverse contexts um, some key points around really addressing those linkages between individual and community trauma, the need to um, develop further you know, research analysis and, and ways of measuring those, those linkages as well as the importance of um, supporting ourselves as well as others. So I'll hand over to, to Vesna now to close. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your contributions, for your thoughts, for your ideas. This was really an opportunity for us to reflect together on the role of mental health in conflict prevention, peace building and healing, and what actually it means for us, for our programs, for our staff, for people that we work, but also for ourselves. There were several takeaways take, take from this session. 
but I, I, I think the maybe the, the, the more important ones are that healing is a vital component of peace building. And also in situations of continuous, continuing violence and conflict, there can be no fully effective healing with the social and political change. So in that way, peace building needs to be part of healing and healing needs to be part of peace building if we are to achieve any, any positive change. And with that, I'm thanking you all for, for your time, for your contribution, and wish to all of us um, a good, a good work and a good mental health and a peaceful world. Thank you and bye-bye. <laughs>